Okay. And Pastor Paul, the word. All right. Thank you, Mike, so much. Thank you so much. It's so glad to see everybody in here. What a great crowd of folks for uh, tonight. So my apologies that I'm, uh, I'm have to leave early, uh, but I truly uh, appreciate this opportunity. I love Mike and Jeannie. They are doing such a great work, as well as all of you. Uh, in this final hour, I like what Mark said as he was praying then. God, give us the fire, give us the direction, give us the desire in this final hour. Uh, and certainly, the world needs to hear from us. Because, you know, you notice everybody now is, Heidi was just today, she was in, uh, she's up in Indiana right now because my son's mother-in-law died uh, unexpectedly uh, Tuesday. And so Heidi went to take care of the family and the arrangements and everything up there. I stayed here to take care of all the appointments and things I had scheduled. And so she went to Myers, and you may be familiar with Myers as a grocery chain. And when she went in, she could not believe how many empty shelves. She took pictures of it. I'm not talking about just a shelf here or a shelf there. I'm talking about entire rows of a, a major grocery store with nothing on it. I mean, there was about six or seven complete rows, complete aisles, empty, wiped out. And, uh, you know, what I'm hearing is uh, it's this isn't bad. It's really going to get bad about February. Um, and so in other words, yeah, it's we have to prepare. I think some of the preppers out there have already been preparing for a long time. Uh, others who haven't are starting to realize that the thing that we've talked about and preached about and said, said it's going to come to pass is coming to pass now. We're not conspiracy theorists. We are realists who have actually studied prophecy and understand the time we're in. So we want to encourage you, though, tonight. And I'm going to take you to St. John 14. Now, I know we've the first part of the chapter everybody's heard before, but there's more in this chapter that I think that can absolutely encourage you during this time and the hour we're in. And in John 14, the Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And this is the words of Jesus Christ. He was preaching to uh, many followers or religious people who had heard of God, or maybe was even at that time trying to follow God in some way, but did not know exactly who he was, that he was Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, alpha and omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last, the one that was dead, but he's alive and that forevermore. I mean, this is Jesus of Nazareth, okay? The undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world was here on the stage and they needed to know if you're believing in God, then you definitely want to believe in me. And the Bible says, in my father's house, are many mansions, not just a few, not just for just the elect or just for the, uh, the elite, but for many mansions. And if it wasn't so, I wouldn't even told you. So in other words, I'm not going to tease you with a mansion and not give you one, okay? Uh, in my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Sounds good. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So here we go. Jesus said, I will come again. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you about these mansions. If I wasn't coming back, I wouldn't even bring up this conversation. I am coming back. And if I come back, I am coming back, and, and I'm going to receive you unto myself. In other words, I'm coming to get you. And so, believe it or not, in these last days, there's a, a doctrine now being preached that Jesus isn't really coming back, that he's, uh, you know, this is just a, a figure of speech or, uh, you know, that was, you know, it's, that sounds nice, but in reality, there is really no second coming of Jesus. There is no rapture. There is no catching away. And they are starting to preach this. And I'm going to tell you why they're doing this, because they have no faith. Because if you, if without faith, it's impossible to please God. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, if you don't believe in the rapture, if you don't believe in the second coming, if you don't believe that Christ is really coming back, then your faith is in vain. You're in your sins. You don't even have a, look, you're lost. You might as well, you know, 
get a ticket on Jeff Bezos next spaceship and try this. Maybe it's your only opportunity to ever see anything. I mean, but Jesus is returning and he's coming after his bride, those that are ready. And then he says, and whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And if he had known me, he should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. So, Thomas, you, you, I know what you're saying. You don't understand how we're going to get there. Follow me. That's what Jesus is saying. A lot of folks today, Christians, all of us, at times we say, I don't know how this thing's going to wind up. I don't know where it's going. That's true. Follow Jesus. Okay. The, the Look, the normal is not coming back, but Jesus is. All right. And uh, so in other words, if you're waiting on normal to come back, forget it. This is your new normal. And it's, it's not changing. It, if, if anything, we're going to continue to see uh, these perilous times uh, in these times we live in. Normal, as you knew it and I knew it, is not coming back, but Christ is. And so let's prepare ourselves for that while still living a life of joy and peace and happiness and power and, and praise. And, uh, you know, we're not going to be forsaken. Uh, you know, we're not going to be destroyed. We're not going to be in distress. For Jesus said, I will never leave you I will never forsake you, but I'm going with you all the way, even to the end of the world. So we've got a promise tonight. We've got a great promise tonight uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's keep our eyes on him. You know, I was just talking, I was just uh, talking to a guy earlier today, a pastor, and uh, he was an African-American, and we were talking about, I was interviewing him because he's running for U.S. Congress, and he's, a, and he's a powerful man of God, and I said to him, I said, Willie, I'd love to see you sitting next to AOC in Congress. He said, I see, he said, if she'll let me sit next to her, I will. But he said, I guess if that happens, my number one goal was to be get her saved. I said, could you imagine? Could you, could you see the headlines? AOC turns to Jesus. I mean, it'd be amazing. Um, uh, but one thing I said to him, I said, in our schools, our parents are being called domestic terrorist because they're standing up against the school boards they're standing up for their children they're refusing to cave we're not giving in just because uh you know they're trying to teach whatever they want to our children our grandchildren and parents are saying enough is enough uh we want to be in control of the curriculum that's being taught in the public schools and you've seen some of these uh, lawmakers and the governor of virginia and different ones say uh, you know look you don't have a right to tell us how to teach your children. This is not going to go well in the United States of America. But there's a thing they're teaching called critical race theory. Critical race theory, which basically says that white people have a superior advantage over uh, people of color, which is an absolute insanity, okay? Critical race theory. But God's given me a word. It's called, we need to preach critical grace theory. OK, uh, <laughs> it is critical that we start preaching the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. The critical grace theory would actually change the world. If people would come to Jesus Christ, there would not be fighting. This. If they started teaching critical grace theory in our schools, forgiveness, love, peace, repentance, uh, uh, boys, you are boys, girls, you are girls. Can you imagine? I mean, there would be a revival break loose in this country. So, um, these are the kinds of things I think God wants us to continue to stand strong. I'm starting to sound like coach Dave now stand strong. Uh, don't back down. Keep going guys. We're on the right track and Jesus will not forsake us in our hour of persecution. Jesus will not forsake us in our hour of uh, uh, tribulation or trial. Jesus will not abandon us if even if everyone else abandons us. We have to keep our eyes on the Lord. Now, I'd like to skip on down if you go to verse 12, because how does this happen? I mean, Jesus isn't even here now. I mean, he went back to heaven, right? I mean, as far as a physical Jesus, but when he said, I won't leave you, he has to give us an assurance somehow. And I like what it says in verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Are you serious? Greater than Jesus? Are you, are you guys flipping out, freaking out here? I mean, Jesus raised the dead. He healed the blinded eyes. He cured the leprosy. He, you know, he turned the water into wine. I mean, he went about doing good. And, and the fact that Jesus was saying, if you believe in me, these works I do, you shall do greater. And I really believe that he's referring to us working together. We can get more done than he could actually himself in a physical form. We, the body of Christ, collectively can do greater works, maybe even, even individually. But I'm certainly going to take the pressure off a little bit here and say collectively we can do greater things. I was very pleased to see that the giving that's going right now to help uh, Shelly Dizdar um, is, is doing extremely well, and I believe that the goal will be met. And uh, I, was, I was thanking God for that. I was just checking that tonight. And I said, Lord, thank you uh, for being so good and for touching hearts and, and, and putting on, on the spirit of, of people and givers out there to, to step up and obey your word because uh, we're to help each other in a time of need, especially them of the household of faith. And it, Russ Dizdar was certainly a man of God of the household of faith, a leader of faith. And so now, as he has departed this world, it is our responsibility to step up and be a support to his wife from the household of faith. And so I want to thank uh, Mike, Jeannie, and all of you from this, uh, from this group here for stepping up and being so faithful. These are the greater works that Jesus was referring to. Matter of fact, and whosoever and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So in other words, when we ask, it, ask for something, let's ask it in Jesus' name. Let's always give the Lord the credit, the glory, and the praise, because it won't get done unless he does it anyway. So, uh, you know, self-glorification is really not big in the body of Christ. Jesus is the one we want to magnify and lift up his name. And verse 14 says, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And I, I, I look at that verse and say, what? Anything? But that's what it says, okay? I think sometimes we have not because we ask not, because it seems impossible. But all things are possible to them that believe. Uh, with God, all things are possible. It says in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 19 verse 26 well, let me read on here it says so you can ask anything in my name of course okay, and i will do it of course that's within reason i mean it's not you're not asking something that's of uh, uh, an abomination or something but i mean within the will of god and then he says if you love me keep my commandments now this is an important scripture here because everything god does and everything that jesus does he does, even in the Old Testament, if you study the Old Testament, the, the, uh, the uh, blessings and the cursings in the book of Deuteronomy, you'll find that there's 14 or 15 blessings and 54 cursings. But the 14 or 15 blessings come with a condition. If you do this, I will do that. If you do this, I will do that. And he says, and prove me or trust me, test me, see if I just won't. He says in Malachi 3. So we know that God puts us to the test, but our our input is small compared to the output that we receive from God. I mean, think about it. We receive salvation through Jesus Christ, through the blood of the lamb. What did we put into getting saved? Uh, what did I contribute to my salvation? Uh, sin, I guess. I mean, I didn't, I didn't contribute anything to get myself saved. I came to Christ just as I am. But he put everything in to save me, to break the chains off of us. So it's not like, so if God asks us to do something, it's like, man, it's small in comparison to his response. We give little, he gives a lot. We, we pray a little, he blesses a lot. We believe a little, he moves mountains. You know, just at the, so, so sometimes we limit God because we disobey or we limit 
ourself or we just don't even make an effort. I think really God is, is saying to us, Jesus is saying here in the scripture, you make a little bit of an effort. Uh, there was a, uh, an old saying I used to say when I was preaching back in Indiana years ago, I'd say, uh, God can take a little and make a lot, you know? Uh, so just give what you can in your time, in your effort, in your prayer life, in your love toward other people and watch what God will do. Verse 16 says, and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter. This is key because Jesus was a comforter. He comforted the people where he was at while he was here physically. But he realized that the whole world was going to come under this, uh, the shadow of the Almighty. If the whole world was going to experience the goodness of God's grace and mercy, then it was an expedient or necessary for him to go away or the comforter, the another comforter would come. And this one is the Holy Spirit of promise, the Holy Ghost, the, 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 the third part of the, of the Godhead who actually comes and takes up his abode in us and fills us with the peace and love and joy and the desire and the strength and the gusto to go forward in these end times. And if you want to know why you're here now and not born earlier, it's because God chose you to be part of the remnant revival of the last days. You are the greatest generation on the, on, in the history of the world because he, God has chosen every one of us to be here for these end times. And he trusts us that we will do his will. He, if he didn't trust us, he wouldn't even, we would have been born and, you know, uh, I, I've been living back in the stone age probably you know if it weren't for god saying i think i think i believe this guy might actually do what i say okay if not he can stay over there and bust rocks okay or whatever they did back in those days although they were pretty smart if you ever go to those monolithic stones down in peru you know, so let's not throw up on this cave dwellers or whoever they were <laughs> but um the comforter he says i'm going to send you another comforter and he, that he may abide with you forever i love this even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I mean, if God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And we've got the power in the name of Jesus. And if we can say to, if we've got the faith of a grain of mustard seed, we can say to any mountain be moved and cast into the sea and it shall be done. And if one could put a thousand demons to flight, two can put 10,000. What can 68 people in a Zoom meeting do uh, if, if we let God have his way in our lives? life. We can shake up the world uh, with the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, okay? I mean, it's incredible. It's unlimited. It's insane. And, and, and so uh, it's, I'm serious. It's just amazing what God can do. It's even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. The world cannot comprehend what we have. They know we have something. They're not sure they want it or not. You know, I noticed this during Halloween. Everybody embraces the goblins, and and uh, you know Freddy Krueger and uh, the dude with the chainsaw and, and and all these other guys. People gravitate to this stuff. It's like they're like, I want to be around it. I'm thinking, what? Are you nuts? But Christianity is like, you know, I'm not so sure. You know, I I, I love you, sister. Yeah. Uh, I hear what you're saying. I'll get back to you. I mean, it's like they know we got something that they don't have, but they're just not sure if they want to get too close to this because this might require a commitment, the C word. And that, that commitment uh, might be more than what they were willing to give until they get it, till they get the Holy Spirit, till they get washed in the blood of Jesus Christ till they get the grace of God in their life. When they get filled with the spirit of the Lord, then all of a sudden they can't get enough of God. It's amazing. Okay. 
it's just one taste. You know, Jesus said, come taste of me. See if I'm not good. I tell you, being a Christian is the greatest thing in the world. I'm not bored with being a Christian. I've been, I've been saved since I was 10 years old. I've not got tired of it. I'm not, I'm not wore out with it. I'm not ready to throw up my hands. I want more and more of Jesus because the more I get, the more I want, the more people I meet with Christ, the more I want to meet more of them. It's just infectious. I mean, you, if they don't put a mask on me pretty soon, everybody's going to get saved. Okay. And so, um, yeah, they're trying to silence us, but uh, they can't. Okay, he says this, verse 18. So I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to send another comfort. And he's going to bless you, and you're going to do more stuff than I could do. So you just don't worry. I'm not lying to you. There's mansions up here. If I weren't so, I wouldn't even drop that one on you. And oh, by the way, I'm coming back and I'm never going to leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And let's just skip on down for time's sake to the 26th verse. And the Bible says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So even if you can't remember everything that Jesus is telling us to do, the Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance. He will remind you. He'll say, wait a minute. You might say, what am I supposed to do? Oh, the Holy Spirit will say, here's what you do. Okay, I'll guide you. I'll direct you. Don't you love that? That the Holy Spirit brings discernment, brings comfort, brings guidance, brings assurances, uh, bring, you know, just a con confirmation, uh, just he stays there with us. And other people may not understand what we're going through. Other people may not see what we're seeing or may not feel what we're feeling or may not just quite get it yet. It's okay. You still have peace with God. You still have confirmation with Christ through the Holy Spirit. And he said, I will uh, never, he says, I will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And then the scripture says in verse 27, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. In other words, I'm not giving you a temporary peace. I'm not giving you a false promise. I'm not going to be, uh, to say one thing and do another. I'm not like the world. When I give you peace, it's a peace that passes all understanding. It is the peace of God. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Fear is the opposite of faith. You can't, there's not enough room in your heart for fear and faith. These are one of the words that Dr. Lester Summerall used to teach us when I was in Bible school with him way back in the day. And he was, uh, I mean, he, he was a pretty stern man. You know, he's the guy that ran into Smith Wigglesworth and, and uh, Wigglesworth, you know, said, what do you do with that newspaper? Don't walk in my house with that those pack of lies. Where's your Bible? And, and, and you know, young Lester was just getting started. He's like, well, I'm just trying to catch up on what's going on. Not in my house. Come on in here, son. And, uh, and uh, he would say, you need to be bold. And, 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 you know, Smith Wigglesworth was one of these giants of faith who was not playing games, didn't have time, didn't have tolerate it. And so Dr. Summerall, uh, young Lester Summerall then received something in his spirit when Wigglesworth laid his hands on him, something of, of a, a holy boldness, if you will. Uh, the, the ability to to recognize the seriousness of the situation, yet he had hands and a loving uh, hug around you that was beyond a father's love. And you knew you were safe in his arms. This was a, 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 a giant among men, uh, a man of faith, compassion, and yet he would not give one inch to the devil, not one inch. And uh, I I'll never forget the time I was in a camp meeting there back in the 90s and uh, the place was packed out at 3,000, 4,000 people. And there was a healing service. And Dr. Summerall was preaching. 
And he said, all right, I'm going to pray for people. They're going to be healed tonight. He didn't say, let's see if they get healed or maybe God might do something. They'll be healed. I remember hearing him say that. And people were coming forward and he was laying his hands on people and prophesying and praying. And all of a sudden the doors opened and there was a man on a cot and it had an IV. And I remember it had the pole there with the bag hanging there, the IV. And they're rolling this guy down the middle of the aisle, trying to get to the front to Dr. Sumrall. And uh, Dr. Sumrall says, wait, 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 what's this? What's this? They said, Pastor Sumrall, this man, he said his name. We just took him out of South Bend St. Joe Hospital. He just checked himself out. He's dying with cancer. He said, you guys aren't going to help me. The only person can is Dr. Sumrall. He was watching the, the uh, service on television. And so they rolled this guy in there. And uh, Summerall says, well, well, let me just say something. You're going to be healed, son. Look right at him. Just point. You're going to be healed. But I want to ask you folks a question. Why do you people wait till folks are almost dead before you bring them in here? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then he said, now in the name of Jesus, be healed. <laughs> Boom. And they, they, they took the guy out of there. Well, about six months later, the man who had stage four cancer was eat up. He was dying walks into that church about six months later and says, I'm the man that was on the cut. Uh, and the place went crazy because they realized. Uh, so what Dr. Summerall was saying, why do we wait to try everything else before we try God? It's actually a lack of faith. We probably should try God first and then maybe go along with some of the other stuff that's happening. But why do we wait? Why is it always 911 God? Okay, and I, I'm raising my hand too, Jeannie, because I think at some time or another, we might all have been guilty of that one, okay? But even through all of that, Jesus, his compassion and his grace and his mercy and his love, it's never, ever failed us. He'll never fail us. We'll fail him, but he'll never fail us. And so tonight, I hope I've left you with some of it. You know, I'm usually the prophecy guy, but tonight, I, God just told me, said, I want you to encourage my people, feed my sheep tonight, encourage them in the work of the Lord. Amen. Well, Pastor, thank you so much. God bless you. You're, you're just, you know, you're, you are, first of all, folks, know this. Pastor Paul Begley is Jeannie and myself. He, he, he's our pastor. He is the man I go to when I've got an issue in my life or something's going on. I go to Pastor Paul and I, I talk to him. Uh, the man is amazing. Uh, you know, he, uh, he managed to get out there to, to uh, San Diego. Uh, and uh, it was just, it was, it was just thrilling. He knocked it out of the park uh, with his presentation.